Thanks, mate. Well, I found out this year that my... There you go. I found out this year that my grandfather, <coughs> in the Second World War, he was in the Desert Rats. And uh, a hundred of them were sent on some mission in North Africa, and only four returned. And my grandfather was then sent back to the UK quite quickly, and on four different boats that he was sent home on, three of them were torpedoed. Wow. So I just don't think the enemy wanted me to be born. Oh, no, <laughs> it's just amazing, you know? So there you go. But, right, well, <coughs> this morning we're going to start part two of our series on the Holy Spirit. So let me just pray and then we'll briefly recap. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you sent an advocate and he is the Holy Spirit and he helps us and strengthens us. He is our advocate, he is our, our comforter, our teacher, he is the spirit of truth. And we pray, Holy Spirit, this morning we would honour you, we would come to know and understand your function, your personality, more and more, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> so yes, yeah, so we're doing this series on the Holy Spirit. As I said before, it's quite easy to uh, relate to God the Father, God the Son, but relating to the Holy Spirit, a lot of people find that a little bit more difficult. And often when we get saved and we get baptised in the Spirit, we're, we're kind of very conscious of Him. But as life goes on and time goes on and you mature, and the, the relationship can become a bit less and less. And so, uh, last week we did the first part looking at the Holy Spirit as a person. So he's not a force, he's not a force in a wire like electricity, he's not like Bluetooth or something like that. He's a person, he's the third part of the Trinity, the Godhead. Some would say the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, either is fine. And so it's, we're looking in this series at cultivating our relationship <coughs> with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. So this morning, if you want to head in, it's part two, and it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, that is gift and not gifts of the Spirit. Just gift, okay? We're not looking at the gifts that the Holy Spirit imparts to us, but rather we're looking at the gift of the Holy Spirit himself. So the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. So he is the gift, he is the purpose of God, he is the presence, his presence, in the lives of God's people. Now there is a clear difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament to the function and role of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so for us to really flow in the things of the Spirit, we really need to come to know and understand the Holy Spirit and the purposes of God that the Spirit brings about. So the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was very active in all sorts of ways, even in creation. It said that the Spirit hovered over the waters of the deep. As well as equipping individuals to complete certain tasks, he is also the divine source of prophecy throughout the Old Testament. So any prophecy that was given by the prophets, the source of that prophecy came from the person that is the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now you can have a look at Exodus 31 verse 2. It says, See I have chosen Bezer, son of Urah, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, with all kinds of skill, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Okay? So when we look at this, we see that the Holy Spirit is the one who was inspiring in the Old Testament a lot of the work that went on. Okay? And often, you know, God does stuff in our lives through the Spirit, and we can think it's us, but in actual fact it's the Holy Spirit, and there's a purpose in it. Amen? I said this several times, I don't 
kind of have any natural talent. I'm not an artist, I'm not I'm a terrible singer. Honestly, I really am. If ever you want to hear me singing, I'll tell you, you, you need the earmuffs. I, mean, I think even God just about manages to put up with it. Uh, but, but I don't have a natural talent in that sense. And I, I look at people who are artists or singers or this, that and that, and I thought, oh, I wish I had a, a natural talent, you know, hairdressing, so I could bless other people with. And sometimes we can forget that the gifts that you've got are to be used to be a blessing. It's not just your hobby. Amen? The gifts that you've got are to be used to be a blessing. They're not just for you and your own hobby. So, uh, now we see that there is an equipping. So the Spirit of God, in this instance, equipped these people as stone cutters, working in gold, silver, bronze, wood, all these different things. And often when you watch historical programs, uh, archaeologists are mystified how certain things could have been built. They say, you know, it's impossible. Even if you look at the pyramids at Giza, they say the stone cutting of those stones is like is millimetres. And with all our technology and everything we have today, we couldn't really do it any better than them. Now, they didn't have the technology, but guess what? They have a God. So God was equipping people through his spirit and had the Spirit of God filling with wisdom and understanding and knowledge with all kinds of skills. So when you look at it, there is a, 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 an equipping with intelligence and wisdom and that sort of thing, but there's also an equipping in the practical realm as well. So it's both ways that the Holy Spirit was working. We see that this man was chosen by the Lord and equipped by the Holy Spirit to construct the tabernacle. See, if God has called you to something and equipped you for it, he won't call you and then leave you ill-equipped. If you feel ill-equipped, maybe you've got into the wrong calling. You like it, you want it to happen, but in actual fact, that's not where God has called you. Quite often, God calls us to do things we actually don't want to do. Yeah, that's right. You know? We, we don't feel naturally comfortable <coughs> in some of the things we get asked to do. Do we, Liam? You know, it's not a natural state. But when God equips you, when God calls you, he'll equip you and he'll anoint you to fulfil his purpose. He won't call you to something and abandon you, but rather he will equip you. And that takes faith on our part to trust that God is going to meet me in the situation when you know it's the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 10, 1 Samuel chapter 10, and verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, talking to Saul, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. So Paul, uh, Saul couldn't prophesy, King Saul, but he was able to because God equipped him. Okay? Now, the problem came in with King Saul that he rebelled against God. So after Israel, so the problem was, to give you the history, uh, Israel was governed by priests. That's what God had ordained. He put priests over the people to govern the people. But Israel saw that the other nations had kings. So they said, you know what? They've got kings. We want a king. And God said, no, I've governed over you priests. But they kept on and on and on to God that they wanted a king. And in the end, God gave them what they wanted. And sometimes, you know, we've just got to accept what God says to us. Okay? But God allowed them to have a king in Saul. Despite it wasn't his desire. This led to the Lord choosing Saul as king over his land. And consequently, God filled and equipped Saul by his spirit to rule over the nation. But this didn't last. It didn't last. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. So he was filled initially with the spirit, he fell into rebellion, and so the Holy Spirit was removed. Because God 
deposed him as king. So God equipped him, but then when he walked away from the will of God, the Holy Spirit was removed from him. So be quiet, because he was no longer doing the job, he was no longer under the anointing because he fell into rebellion. What happened that caused the Spirit of God to depart from him? In, in that chapter 1, uh, 1 Samuel 15, if you can read it in your own time, you'll find that uh, God had commanded Saul through the prophet Samuel to eliminate, completely annihilate the Amalekites and destroy all their livestock and kill all of them. But he allowed the king to live and he kept the best of their livestock. And God had said, look, wipe these people out. Destroy all their livestock. Don't keep anything. Kill everything. But he decided to keep the king alive and the livestock. And then he became manipulative because he said, well, I've kept the livestock alive so that we could make sacrifices to you, Lord. And it was trying to twist God's arm a bit and justify what he did. But it was wrong. And from that moment, God removed the spirit from him because he was no longer fulfilling the role of the king. So you begin to see here a trait that in the Old Testament, the role of the Holy Spirit was to help people fulfill tasks. That was the role of the Holy Spirit, to bring prophecy. 1 Samuel 16, 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Okay? So now David, Saul, is still serving as king, but without the Holy Spirit equipping him. And in the meantime, God has anointed David and filled him with the Holy Spirit to be able to complete the task. And that should give great joy to us. As I said, God's not going to call you to something and then leave you ill-equipped. He's going to equip you for the job as well. He's going to get you through the river. He's going to get you past the problem, whatever it is. And David had an intimate relationship with God. Far more than what Saul ever did. Saul was only placed as king at the demands of the people. Because they kept on and on and on and on and on. And in the end, God says, fine, have a king. And they just wanted what other people had. And we have to be very careful that we don't just desire things because somebody else has got them. I think I shared this story before about a, an old colleague of mine. He, he had a, a daughter and a son, uh, a son, and they were out shopping in the supermarket. And the daughter had a, a, a monthly cycle. And so the, the father got some uh, towels, things, and put them in the shopping basket for her and carried on. But then the son caught them up and he's got a packet of, of towels as well. And he puts them in and the dad said, what are you doing with them? Why are you, what are you putting them? He said, well, she's got some, I want some. <laughs> he didn't even know what they were for. But I want it just because they've got it. Okay, and we have to be careful that we don't become like that in life. I want it just because they've got it. We have to be careful, even with the things of God. There are many things I wanted God to do with me. He didn't do it. Did it with somebody else, didn't do it with me. You know? But we have to remain secure in God. Amen? Just remain secure that you are fulfilling the will of God. Whether he chooses you to do something great or something small is irrelevant. The main thing is that you fulfill the will of God. Amen? Amen. <coughs> so Psalm 51, verse 11, David says, do not, cast from, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Mm. See, he'd learned from Saul. He'd seen Saul operate under the anointing of God and he'd seen Saul operate without the anointing of God. And David's plea was, take not your spirit from me. Because why? He was totally dependent. Totally dependent on God. He knew he couldn't do it in himself. He needed God. He was dependent on God. And it shows the intimacy that David had with God in his understanding. He didn't just know about God, but he knew God relationally. It's amazing 
that God withdrew the Holy Spirit from Saul on the basis of disobedience, which we read, while the Holy Spirit remained with David even though David committed adultery and murder. But yet God did not withdraw the Spirit from him, even though he committed these huge things. Could this be because Saul had rejected the Lord through his actions? He didn't trust God? See, David's sin was not a sin between, if you like, between him and God. It was his weakness, it was his flesh, and he got distracted. He should have been at war. That's where he should have been. And instead he was at home. And he got distracted and he committed the sin of the flesh. But Saul rebelled directly against God's commands. But David pleaded, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Wow, isn't that amazing? Yet with Saul, it's a different situation. David was a man of true repentance through his actions. He repented while Saul made excuses. Mm -hmm. He just made excuses and tried to find a gag. Well, he wasn't repentant, really. He got caught. You know, you meet people and they say, oh, I've, I've admitted my crimes. No, you got caught. <laughs> you got caught. You didn't admit your crime. You got caught. It's totally different to admitting your crime and what it is to getting caught. And even sometimes people get caught and they still deny them. See, where there is repentance, there is grace. You know what? No matter what you've done, the whole world can condemn you. But if you have repented, there is grace. And you know what? If there's one thing that ticks off religious people, it's God's grace. God is a God of grace. He is a God of love. He is a God of restoration. And the religious world don't like it. They don't like it. And the religious world can, can dress up and look all spiritual and born again, but you see, sing the, you see, see, see the fruit. But David is described as a man after God's own heart. So what, Saul didn't have the same heart as God. He didn't. There was a, a motive. There was self involved. But David had a heart after God. And God looked at the heart and acknowledges it. And he paid the price for his sins. But God does not withdraw the Holy Spirit and he remained under the anointing of the Spirit throughout his reign. Wow! Incredible. Absolutely amazes me. As well as ministering through kings and priests and certain individuals, the Holy Spirit empowered prophets to speak to the nation. When God desired to say something to the people, this is why these Israelite kings always had prophets around them so that the Holy Spirit could instruct the prophet and the prophet would then instruct the king. And the people of the whole Old Testament did this because why? They didn't have a personal relationship and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It was not there. That was not the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was equipping people for the task that they had to do. That was the role of the Holy Spirit. Under the New Covenant, it's different for us, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Numbers 11 and verse 17. Numbers 11 and verse 17. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them and they will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. So Moses is leading the Israelite nation and he's struggling with leadership and he's struggling big time. Moses is struggling to the point that he's depressed. He's fed up with it. He don't want to do it. He didn't ask for the job in the first place. He did a bunk into the desert. He was minding his own business, looking after the sheep. He wasn't looking to be used. But God picked him. And so Moses becomes this leader of a nation and he's struggling with the burden of leadership. And whether you're the leader of a great nation or a small uh, 
sin or whatever leadership brings with it its own burdens. It's a privilege, but it brings burdens with it as well. And when the Israelites were fighting and Moses had his arms up, the Israelites would be winning. But as soon as Moses became weak and his arms began to droop down, the Israelites would begin to fall and falter and begin to lose the battle. So God placed strategically men around Moses to keep an eye on Moses. They were not there to keep an eye on the people or the needs of the people in the battle. That wasn't their job. Their job was to make sure that their leader was well equipped, strong, and his arms were held up. And if our leader's well equipped and his arms are held up strong, then we will win the battle. See, sometimes we can get into different roles and we can take our eyes off the role. Often we, as leaders, we can get our eyes too focused on the people and not focused enough on God. And that's what happened with the, uh, when, the, when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments. And when he wasn't there and the authority had gone, all of a the sudden they got together and began to have debates and censors and everything else. And they said, uh, get all their gold, melt it down, make a, a, a golden calf and begin to worship. Moses comes down from the mountain and flips his lid and smashes the commandments. Has to go back up again. Wow. So he was going to take of the spirit what was on Moses and place it on them because Moses was the leader. Okay? And there is a light heartedness in. in where God uses a group of people together. And that is not to say that everybody has to be a, a reproduction of somebody else. That's no good at all. And you certainly don't want yes men around you, but you do want people who are of the same heart. The disciples had to work together. And when the Holy Spirit came in the New Testament, it says they were all of one accord. Paul said, let us contend as one man. You see? And sometimes it's quite funny in church leadership where you get, you know, you, you, you get divisions in church leadership and congregations are, oh, we're not happy there's divisions in church leadership and everything else. If there's no divisions in church leadership and they're all contending as one man, then they turn around and say, well, you know, everyone's a yes man and they've got the same opinion. Well, what do you want? But scripture says, isn't it beautiful, isn't it wonderful when brethren dwell together in unity? It's like the anointing rolling down Aaron's uh, robe onto his beard and down his collar. You know? And so we have to get these things right. The gift of prophecy was given temporarily to the elders to support Moses in order to establish them as leaders over God's people. Numbers 27, verse 18. Numbers 27, verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom the spirit of leadership is in, and lay your hands on him. Okay? So God equipped Joshua and gave him the spirit of leadership, which was the Holy Spirit. He, he, God will place the people around you that you need to fulfil the task. Amen? Reinhard Bonnke, uh, who's one of the great modern day evangelists for Africa, he turned around and said he was God's third choice for Africa. God's third choice. See, if you're not willing to step up to the plate and fulfil your role, do not think that the ministry is going to die without you. God will pick somebody else. It's that simple. But be the first choice. Amen? I want to be the first choice in whatever God calls me to do. I want to be open and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So there was an impartation when Moses laid his hands on Joshua and the spirit of leadership came upon him. Why? So that he could serve as an apprentice to Moses. Wonderful. This commissioning was so that eventually Joshua would replace Moses as the leader over these people. You can look at Daniel. Daniel was a wonderful prophet. 
time and time again, Daniel prophesied, and he prophesied in a culture which was full of the occult. The occult <laughs> realm was heathen in the Babylonian and uh, Persian, Mede empires. They were very, very occultic. And yet Daniel is not afraid at all. He's just confident in God. And sometimes we can back off and get, oh, you know, oh, 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 oh. you know, we're covered with the blood of the Lamb. Don't be naive, but know who's got your back. Amen? Amen? Understand the power and the authority that you have with the blood of Jesus. Amen. See, with the, when the blood of Jesus, when, when the blood of uh, animals was spilled, it wasn't just about spilling the blood. In the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice the animal and then do something with the blood. And the blood was sprinkled on the altar or sprinkled on the people or so on and so forth. And often we say we claim the blood but we don't do nothing with the blood. When Moses had, had told Pharaoh about all the uh, plagues, when the uh, uh, spirit of death was going to come, the, they were told to kill a lamb. But the spilling of blood was not enough. Don't just kill the lamb. Now use the blood. Apply the blood. And they put the blood over the door frame and on the threshold of their houses. They actually made a cross sign with the blood and it was symbolic of what was to come through Jesus Christ. And they did something with the blood and they believed that this was going to save them and shape them. And now, today, modern day Christians have forgot the power of the blood. We talk about the blood but we don't know how to apply it. We're like a teenager who goes into the bathroom to have a wash. Yeah, they look at the tap and just come back out again and say, yeah, I'm done, I'm ready to go. And then use half a bottle of their dad's deodorant to cover up the smell. Well, that was just me, maybe. But nonetheless, you know, we've got to apply it. It's not enough. Do you know, in the Old Testament, when they did the offerings under Moses, 400,000 animals slaughtered. 400,000 animals slaughtered. Wow. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of lamb stew. You know, that's big time. But we've got to remember to apply the blood. The blood of Jesus. And take authority using the blood of Jesus. So, getting back to Daniel. Daniel 5 verse 11. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him as chief of the music, uh, magicians, enchanters and astrologers and diviners. So they had all this occultic uh, predictions going on. But then Daniel, the man of God, gets placed in authority over all of them. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? But we shy away, we would just shy away and say, oh no, you don't want to go in there, that's demonic, that's this, that and the other. And we tend to hide away, you know. And we forget, no, we go in with the power of the blood of Jesus. I remember years ago, I got kicked out of the spiritualist church. And I went to the spiritualist church because I just wanted to understand how they function. And the, the leader there was very nice to me and welcomed me in and... We got chatting and sat on the pew. Then it was a weekday, nobody else was there apart from one other bloke. And uh, then I shared that I was a Christian and I believed in Jesus, in his death, burial, and resurrection. And this guy just manifested the spirit, started screaming, Get out, get out, get out, get out! You know? And I challenged the caretaker, I challenged the caretaker, I said, Listen, let me come to one of your meetings where you're contacting the dead. By the way, you're not contacting the dead, you're contacting an evil, mimicking spirit. You're not contacting the dead. But let me come, and I guarantee you nothing will happen in Jesus' name. But on a condition, he said, What's that? I said, You come to my church, and you will see what will happen by the power of God. He refused. <laughs> now who knows what happened at some point? We don't know. But where the anointing of God came, again you see these things connected with it. Intelligence and wisdom. And some people say, oh I'm under the anointing, I'm under the anointing. I think, oh please, 
for the love of God, if that's the anointing, we're all in trouble because you are acting like an idiot. That's not the anointing of God. The anointing of God brings wisdom and the fruit of the Spirit with it. That's the anointing of God. It gives you the ability to work out things that you should not be able to work out. Many times I've sat in meetings with uh, uh, high-powered politicians and uh, I had two hours with Theresa May uh, talking about uh, deprivation in society and everything. I sat with Theresa May for two hours. No, I was expelled from school, I've got no qualifications, I had no experience, I had no nothing. But God gives you the wisdom. Another time I was invited to a Hudson with uh, when uh, David Cameron was Prime Minister. And I went to this Hudson's and I sat on the back row feeling insecure and inadequate, thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I here? And I sat on the very back row, we couldn't get any further back. And then somebody came in who had arranged it and grabbed me by the hand and said, come and sit up here with me. And they sat me right on the second row. So I thought, well, Lord, I've got a big mouth. You obviously want me to use it. And in that hut, I got to publicly challenge the Prime Minister about uh, the church and state and the relationship and what was going on. What God, not me, I'm a donor. But in Christ, there's wisdom. So you meet a lot of people say, oh, I'm so anointed by God, I've got this, that, and then you think we're complete. The starting point is that there would be some wisdom. So you see, the, the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was to anoint for task. When the task was done, there was a removal of the Holy Spirit. The job was done, the Holy Spirit was removed. So the Holy Spirit came in and anointed these people for purpose. But he did not reside with these people. It was to equip, to bring about the will of God. That was the purpose. But then we see some wonderful prophecy, Joel 28, uh, Joel 2 verse 28. Joel 2 verse 28. And afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. And this was a prophetic statement about the future church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit which was radically going to change things completely in the New Testament. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 says, And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and, you, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to obey my laws. Amen? See, Jesus, by his spirit, has written his laws upon our heart. Now, as we move into the New Testament... At first, so we, we see the Old Testament, we understand the role of the Holy Spirit was to equip for task. It was not personal relationship. It was to equip to bring about the job, to get the job done. That was the role of the Spirit. Yes, they had a relationship with the Father, but they didn't have a relationship with the Son, Christ Jesus. They believed on the Messiah to come. They believed the Messiah was going to come, but they didn't have a personal relationship. And they didn't have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, but some did have a relationship with the Father. Okay? So now we move forward to uh, the, the pre-covenant New Testament. Okay? So that means before Jesus died, the covenant came in with the New Testament when Jesus died and rose again. That's when the covenant came in. That's when the church was birthed. But prior to that, the New Testament is still about the Jewish nation and the Jewish history. And that's why it means a lot of people take scripture out of context because they don't understand who it was being applied to. And they begin to take scriptures and use them or speak them out and they don't understand who the audience was. Okay? We have to understand. So this is the Holy Spirit prior to Jesus dying on the cross. John 20, verse 19. John 20, verse 19. On the, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the door locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, 
Jesus come and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And his disciples were overjoyed. And again, Jesus said, Peace with, be with you. As, I, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he breathed on them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone of their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. Now, before this, we see that there was a sending out of the 72 disciples. Remember? And he breathed on them. This, in this part here, this is a similar manifestation. Okay? This event is similar to the equipping of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. But it's not the commissioning yet. This is not the indwelling yet. If we look at Luke 1.35. Luke 1.35. The angel, of the, uh, uh, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This is when Mary was being told that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, or the Spirit of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And it was equipping her for the task. But it wasn't baptism of the, of the Spirit. It wasn't a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It was to equip her for the task. When Jesus breathed on the 72, it was not baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It was still pre-covenant. And it was to equip them to do the job that they've been called to do. Like with John the Baptist, he was equipped and filled by the Spirit before he was even born due to his calling which was to prepare the way for the Messiah which he could not do in a, as a natural man in his own state. He needed the Holy Spirit. The aspect of the new covenant is the promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant. The Spirit dwells in every believer according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So suddenly we see there's a difference. This isn't now about the Holy Spirit equipping you to do the job. This is now the Holy Spirit is going to dwell in you and seal your salvation. It's not about equipping anymore. It's actually about relationship. Suddenly things are beginning to change under the new covenant. With this, there's the promise to the believer to be filled with the special presence of God, a spiritual transformation of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit which would help the believer obey God's laws. God has now made the believer a new man or a new woman filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot dwell in the own heart. It has to be born again. The Holy Spirit cannot dwell in the life of a non-Christian. He can only dwell in the life of a believer. Now he can bring uh, uh, counsel to the believer, he can bring revelation to the believer, but he cannot. What he, what he brings to the non-believer is the prompting to salvation. That's the role. The role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a non-believer is to prompt them to salvation. So we see the Holy Spirit empowered certain people for individual tasks, to fulfil particular tasks. This empowering was not uh, permanent and it was restricted. Thankfully for us, because of the events of Pentecost onwards, we are given the Holy Spirit on a permanent relationship. 
John chapter 16 and verse 5. John 16 verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me where, where are you going? Rather you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Amen? So suddenly, the Holy Spirit under the New Covenant needs the authority of the Father and the Son. In the Old Testament, he did not need that same uh, commissioning. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit needs this release from, the, uh, from Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, unless I go, you'll be ill-equipped. And the disciples in their human nature are trying to hold on to them with everything that they can. They don't want Jesus to go. They love him. And they're securing him. But he's saying, look, I've got to go. I've got to go. If I don't go, then the Holy Spirit won't come. You can't have both because the Holy Spirit is the ambassador of the Father and the Son. And he is the equipper. So the, 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 as much as the disciples are wanting Jesus not to go, he's got to go so that the Holy Spirit can come. And see, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are always in unity. Always in unity, perfect unity, each one supporting the next. And Jesus knew the ministry of the Holy Spirit and was, was happy to leave the disciples. And he doesn't leave them in grief. They put themselves in grief. The reason they put themselves in grief is because they do not understand the Word of God. And we struggle with grief sometimes. We struggle to understand circumstances. We can't get our brain, our heart round it. And do you know what? It's okay. You're not God. There were some situations that happened in mine and Mara's life and I say, God, why? I don't understand it. This is very easy for me to work out, Lord, and I'm not God and I'm not right. But I'm just saying, I can work this out. This is injustice and this is a right and everything else. And Lord, you just don't seem to be doing anything. And then I have to shut my big man and say, Lord, you are sovereign, not me. You know all the circumstances, not me. You know the past, the present and the future, not me. God knows every decision you have ever made before you made it. Before you were created in your mother's womb, God knew every decision you would ever make and he knew the outcome. Not only that, he knew every outcome if you made a different decision. So if Ricky had decided not to marry Jane and married Sharon instead, God knew the outcome, you don't like Sharon, God knew the outcome of every day of what his life would look like if he, in a split second, made a different decision. That's God. See, you'll deal with grief better and set and disappointment better if you understand the sovereignty of God better. When you begin to understand the sovereignty of God, there's a security. Okay, now often I say to God, Lord, I wouldn't do it that way. I don't understand this. I don't understand that. But I know your heart towards me is for good. I know the price that I cost you. So therefore, I can trust you. Even though according to me, this is a much better way. And I'm more than happy to haggle with you over it if you'll allow me. But, fair enough, your sovereignty is what I'm going to submit to. I'm going to live life in the spirit and not in the flesh. Living life in the... See, the flesh, we're human. We forget we're human sometimes. We can forget it. But we're human beings and we react and we overreact. And other times we don't act at all. You know, we're human and we're not God and we don't understand the fullness of God. If I knew the fullness of God, it would not be God. Mm. It would not be God. My God would have shrunk down to my own capacity. Well, then he's not God anymore, he's equal with me. But my God is far beyond anything I can understand. Hallelujah. Far beyond. I don't want to understand God completely. If I understand God completely, no longer God. 
It is a mere, mere human can understand this divine God who has always been and will always be and flung the stars into space with his fingertips. And I can just understand him like, yeah, yeah, me and God, yeah, yeah, I've got the heart, God, know everything, yeah, 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 I know what he's feeling, doing it. What a load of old rubbish, rubbish. It's with reverent fear when we lean on the Holy Spirit and we are privileged to have the mind of Christ placed within us and he exposes us to some things. And you know what? You will gain more understanding and more revelation and more knowledge the more humble you become. I, be I learned, I realised, I began to learn a lot more about God when I realised I didn't know very much at all. Mm. I suddenly had an increase in my understanding. Before I thought I was pretty, pretty sound on uh, theology and everything else and yeah, you know, and man alive and God slaps you one and you realise just how much you don't know and the more you, you, the closer I get to God the more vast the more amazing the more wonder the more I don't even want to understand him I don't want to understand God completely and God for thousands of years has been saying my ways are not your ways but yet man is trying to work them out and God's already said look give it up you're never going to understand so we don't understand, but the one thing we do understand is God's love and sovereignty. And we can rest in it. I don't know why it's not happening. I don't know why I'm getting healed. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why that. But you know what? I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. Even amongst my fear, you love me. You sent your son to die for me. And on that basis, I stand. John 14 verse 26, John 14 verse 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What a beautiful scripture, the most common one ever read at a funeral. Now, I always read this scripture at a funeral. Always, always, always. Well, I don't particularly, but I like to be a bit different. But, uh, but it's always read. But it says, the advocate. The word advocate means a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular case or policy of a barrister. That's an advocate. So the Holy Spirit is the advocate who publicly supports us in the heavenly realm. Isn't it wonderful? And Jesus is the advocate as well. So the, the Spirit and the Son both doing the same task. Now the scripture I read before, it said, But I am going to the Father uh, who sent me. If you... But, very truly, I say to you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come. And Jesus said, I will send him to you. Okay? Jesus said, I will send him to you. But in this scripture, it says, the Holy Spirit, whom, whom the Father will send. See, the always unity. Always unity. See, whether God does it, whether the Son does it, whether the, the Spirit does it, there's always unity. And if you want to check the will of God in your life, sometimes you need to, you need to check with... See, sometimes people just take the scriptures out oh, no, this, 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 this. But you've got to check that scripture in context. And does that scripture and what you're trying to say match up with the heart of God? Does it match with the heart of God? If it doesn't, you're taking it out of context. You know? In the Old Testament, the days of Jesus, if your children disobeyed you, you could take them to the city wall in front of the elders and stone them. And it was legal, it was fine. Watch out, boys. <laughs> now when I say stone them, I don't mean give them a free cigarette. Alright? I mean they were properly stoned, not modern day stoned. But does that scripture, if we applied that today, it would be out of context with the heart of the Father and without the circumstances that have happened in the New Testament. So you can't apply that scripture, it's out of context now. It's a historical uh, 
record. But it's not for the believer. Okay? So we just have to be clear. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So you see this double working between Jesus and Father. The Father's going to send him, but he's going to do it in my name. He's going to use the name of the Son and the authority of the Son to send the Spirit. So the Father's going to send him under the authority of the Son and the, the Spirit is going to acknowledge that and move. So there's this perfect unity. Whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything you have said. Well, I need some more help with that in the kitchen. Sometimes I go in the kitchen, I stand in the kitchen and go, there's a good reason I'm here, I just don't know why. Why did I come down here? Have you done that? You run all the way upstairs, our, our house is three storeys. Run all the way to the top, get to the bedroom. Oh no. Why did I come? And you get all the way back down again. And why is it when you get all the way back, you should remember what it was? That's what it was. Glasses, glasses. Run all the way back up to the top again. Can't find your glasses anywhere. Run back down again. Have a look for them. You're wearing them. Yeah, I mean, that's proper, the problems I'm facing, it's awful. <laughs> old age, old age. What is it with old age and men? Men getting old. We lose our hair on our head when we're getting old, men. But suddenly it starts growing out of your shoulders, or your back. I've got my first chest hair at the age of 48. I don't know what's going on, suddenly it's on the hair, it looks like a leak. Looks like the root of a carrot or something. I was going to shave it off the other day, but I thought, no, I've only, I've only got this one. I'll keep it. But I'm receiving. What is it with old age? Everything to get... Oh, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Honestly, I need medical help, I think. But yeah, yesterday we watched a film. And I couldn't remember what the film was we watched. We watched one in the, in the afternoon. You were asleep. She'd be night work. And I watched this film, and then I got up to that, what was that film? I watched the whole thing, I liked it. Could I remember what it was, no? Just the love and the money. Could not remember. Mum wanted to watch a film in the evening, so we watched this film, The Green Book. Very, very good, I must say. Beautiful film, The Green Book. And uh, reminded me of me and Tony, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a crafty man, look at that. But then this morning, Mum was like, oh, that film we watched, what was it? I can't remember. What, what was it? And she'd been there. You don't go to the cinema with Marla. Don't even watch a film with Marla or my boys. They, they talk all the way through the film. The whole way through it does my head in. And I'm, I'm, I'm manifesting patience in the Holy Spirit. You know? They even turn my hearing aids off so I can't hear them. Cinema with Marla. She says, like, start talking back to the screen. Something happened. Well, that's not very nice. Why has he done that? Well, like, shh, shh. And then she laughs at Pits of the film, not even funny. And she's the only one laughing her head off. And you're like, ah, oh, I'm looking around and saying, sorry, she got no need to. I'm her carer. You know? And it's awful. And she just watch, watch your movies. And the other thing that Mara read into these two now, or not Caleb, I'll let one, but Luke, watching a film too impatient to see what's going to happen and start going on Google no. yeah, to see what happened in the no. film and then no consideration for me they start talking about it I paid 10 quid for the DVD I've been waiting and they're sitting there talking about it because they've looked it up on Google honestly if there's a crime that deserves death then that's pretty close to it love. Honestly, don't watch a film with them. It's, it's just <laughs> awful. Awful. Mind you, my other weakness is going to the cinema, you get all comfy. They kind of know what I'm talking about. You get all comfy, the seats are warm, and you lean back further and further. One eye open, just watching it. The other eye open, and the both eyes gone. <laughs> Honest. Old age. <laughs> I think it suits me, actually, old age. Yeah, I'll take it down. I'm getting wrinkles, I'm not complaining. I don't So, in finishing our scripture, we've nearly finished this morning. I will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. 
Do not let your heart be troubled. And do not be afraid. Amen? Amen. Amen. Acts 1 verse 4. Acts 1 verse 4. So we can see, when Jesus has said this, he has said, look, I'm releasing the Holy Spirit. And part of what he's going to do is, uh, the Holy Spirit is the one that is the peace that you need. See, when vicars read these scriptures at funerals, I feel sorry for the unbelievers because they've turned around and read that scripture uh, uh, and my peace I leave you and uh, I do not give to you the same way the world gives, do not let your heart be troubled, do not be afraid. How is a non-believer going to actually understand that? How can they understand that? I'd be sitting there as a non-believer thinking, well, what about the tosh? Because my heart is troubled and I don't get it. And I've got no peace. I've just lost my loved one. And you're telling me to sit here and not let my heart be troubled? What are they about Tosh? That's what I've been thinking. But what they need to do is say, share the gospel of Jesus Christ at the funeral and then say, now things will change if you receive Jesus because he is your peace and he sent the Holy Spirit rather than just reading the scripture. Acts 1 Verse 4. On one occasion while he was still eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift, not gifts. Not with an S. Wait for the gift, not gifts. See, sometimes we elevate the gifts of the Spirit higher than the gift of the Spirit. Yes. Yeah? Sometimes we elevate the gifts of the Spirit higher than the gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit is the personality and the person of the Holy Ghost. That is the gift. But sometimes all we're interested in is the gifts of the Spirit. What he can do, how he can change my life. I want this gift of healing and prophecy and everything else. But we are neglecting him as a person. You know, it's a bit like saying, well, I'm not interested in, in Mara. I just want to know that she can iron my shirt or that she can cook a dinner or she can do this, that and the other for me. But not wanting to spend any time with her, but just tapping on the door every time I need something done. And there's so many charismatics out there that just glory in the gifts of the Spirit and they forget the gift that Jesus gave. And that is the Holy Spirit as the person. We need to prioritise that in our lives. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Spirit. Acts 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly the sound of a blowing or violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire spreading and coming to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Amen? This was the permanent infilling of the Holy Spirit for relationship, not just the task. Amen? See, the gifts of the Spirit are for task, but the gift of the person is for relationship. And the more relationship you have, the more understanding you will have about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're moving to a whole new level of power and authority in the things of God when you can separate the gift of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. Trust me. The Holy Spirit enables us, teaches us, leads us, directs us, reveals the word of God to us, comforts us, consoles us, gives us discernment, seals our salvation, leads us in worship, strengthens us, gives us boldness, puts courage in us, fills us with love, gives us the mind of Christ, intercedes, advocates and indwells in us. We have so much more than the saints in the Old Testament. They had the Holy Spirit just for task. We have him for relationship. 24-7. And he resides within you. Amen. Wonderful. What joy. 
Why is it we only become alive to the gifts of the Spirit when we're in the big conferences and people are falling over and demons are being cast out and suddenly we're all aware of the Holy Spirit? We should have an awareness of the person of the Holy Spirit on a far regular basis. Not just, uh, the manifestations are great, don't get me wrong, I love all that, that's wonderful, but I love the person more. Amen? Amen. I love my wife more, who she is, than what she does. Amen? But I love her more. And sometimes we love the things of the Spirit, if you think about it, and not the person of the Spirit. And it's not easy to cultivate. It's, it's, it's a real changing of mindset. And that's why we're on this series, because my desire as your pastor is to honour God and move in truth and see you guys set free and equipped for everything God wants for you to do, to be healed, to be whole, to come up to the full measure of Christ. We can't do that without a fuller understanding of the Holy Spirit of God. Impossible. So that's why we're on the journey. Amen. In closing, remember this, not one person in this room has earned or deserves the right of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's yes. grace. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of Jesus Christ to his bride. We are the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the engagement ring in our lives. It's the gift that Jesus gave. And you know, in, in their old cultures, the Father would give financially to the son so that the son could then purchase the engagement ring or give a dowry because the son didn't have it himself so the father would supply it to the son so that the son could then apply it to the to the bride's family and to the bride and we see exactly the same thing spiritually we see the Father sending the Holy Spirit on behalf and under the authority of the Son and the Son uh, releases the Holy Spirit to his bride. And it is the Holy Spirit that brings the unity between church, between bride and bridegroom. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? What joy. It is a free gift from God himself. A gift that we received fully at the moment we believed in the work of the person of Jesus Christ. In the, remember in this, the Old Testament was about task and to bring about the will of God. Even in the New Testament, before the resurrection of Christ. But after that, resurrection and Jesus released the Holy Spirit, it changed completely. It became about relationship and to help the Christian fulfill the will of God in our day by day lives. The, the purpose of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was to fulfill the will of God pretty much solely. The purpose of the Holy Spirit today in our lives is changed. In the Old Testament, it was purely about God and God's will and God's purpose. Now, it's about equipping the saints, protecting the saints, educating the saints, advocating for the saints, doing all this for the saints. It's completely different, a different role and a different purpose. In the Old Testament, it's purely about the Father and fulfilling his will. In the New Testament, it's about you. Jesus said, I won't leave you alone, I'm going to send the Spirit and he's going to do this for you, he's going to do that for you and he's going to intercede and he's going to protect you and he's going to give you gifts and he's going to give you insights and you're going to speak in new tongues and you're going to raise the dead and you're going to do this and you're going to do that and it's about the church. Wonderful, isn't it lovely? You can see, you can imagine, as I said last week, the Holy Spirit just eager, wanting to get down and get amongst this, this new move of God and have relationship with the people. We've not had that before. And now he's going to have the relationship that he desired. Wonderful. Wonderful. So the New Testament is about relationship. It's about the Christian. It is about you coming into the fullness of what God has for you and to become who he 
who he desires you to be. We have such a wonderful advantage. When I think of the saints of old, like David and Moses and Abraham, and they, their salvation laid ahead of them in a promise that was to come, the Messiah, and they didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For us, our salvation has already happened, and we look back spiritually, historically, and we know it's documented, and then on top of that, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us 24-7, even when you muck up, he doesn't take away the Holy Spirit from you. You haven't got to cry that, you haven't got to say that prayer, take not your spirit from me. He won't take the spirit from you. He say, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Though you forsake me, though you walk away, I will never leave you because I'm a covenant God. Oh, what joy. So surely we should be doing so much more than the saints of old done. Now that's the challenge when you think of it. Amen? Hallelujah. Next week, part three. And we're going to look at a whole lot more stuff. Trust you're blessed. Join us for tea and coffee afterwards. Hang around. If you want prayer, then the elders are here. Just come forward and we can pray together. We're just going to close with one there, one song in worship. Don't forget, uh, see Ricky if you need details for the leadership conference. Uh, see Carl if you're coming on the men's breakfast. Sorry, it's men's breakfast. Nobody else is alive. And the thing that got me this week... Do you know you, you, you see things on the news and they wind you up? It's this new one. I just this is nothing to do with God. Right? This is just me on a party political broadcast. Do you know the latest one? What's come out now? You're not single. For those of you who are single, you're not single. You're not single anymore. What was it? No. no. Self-partnered. 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 Self I'm not, yeah, a single person. You're not single anymore, you're self-partnered. Self-partnered. And they did an interview with an actress, the little girl who used to be in Harry Potter. Emma Watson. Emma Watson. Emma Watson. Emma Watson. They've asked her about...